Welcome back, everyone, to Design Huddle, a podcast where two internet friends break down what's new in tech and UX design. Uh, in today's episode, we have a special guest, Iwana Taliuno. Uh, she is a senior UX designer with a super impressive background in RPA, healthcare, financial services, and banking. Uh, she's also one of my favorite uh, mentors. She uh, does a lot of design inspiration. She's the co-host of an amazing podcast called Honest UX Talks, which we'll dive into uh, that. And oh yeah, she created UX Goodies, which now has over 210,000 followers on Woo. Instagram. She cre- posts you know, v- amazing snackable UX content. It is like by far my favorite uh, place if you're a UX designer, whether you're just starting or you've been in the industry for a while. Um, well, so we'll have to ask how she's gotten to that point. The last time we interviewed her, she was at like 50. So she's 4X since the last time we spoke. But um, Iwana, welcome back. Thank you for joining us. How are you doing today? Thank you so much, Ryan and Mustafa, for inviting me. It's really, actually, I know that when, he, when we first recorded together, um, it was my first podcast or my second podcast ever. And I know <laughs> that we, we said that we need to have a second episode at some point, probably the following year. And the following year was the pandemic and everybody was like <laughs> oh, doing no, nothing. And now we're actually keeping our word <laughs> by having this, uh, this uh, sequel, let's say, to our first conversation. Yeah. And I'm happy to uh, meet Mustafa and also be able to chat with him. And so you gave me a, an awesome intro. I hope I will uh, live up to the expectations that now <laughs> no, the definitely. listeners might have. We also have. didn't even talk about your, you're also a UX manager at UiPath, which is super exciting as well. So you have a lot going on. So we have a lot to, a lot to touch on. Um, but why don't we start from the top for people that don't know you. Um, how did you get started with design? How did you get to where you're currently at? Yeah, so uh, I got started with design, I think, not a very long time ago. I think it's like six, seven years now. Um, I was working in a very big corporate world uh, in a big bank. And uh, I wasn't doing design initially. I was kind of doing something mm, a bit overlapping with the UX role, but the UX role was not yet invented in that company. And so immediately as it was uh, formalized and it, it, uh, it came about in that company and, they, and the design team was formed, I kind of, it was the first time I heard about UX. Like I knew there were app designers out there, but I didn't really understand the concept of UX in particular. And so it was like, okay, now I know what I want to do with my life. <laughs> it was like an instant revelation. And then, uh, yeah, I had to uh, hustle a little in order to be able to get a UX role because nobody wanted to hire juniors, not even in the same company. And it was the same with the entire market. And so I had to push and really be persistent, which is not necessarily something that comes naturally to me because I'm really I don't want to upset people or be uh, or force them or insist on stuff. And so it was really hard. And I went against what I what I felt like doing. But it it uh, it paid off, and uh, eventually I got a role. So this is how I started uh, in a yeah in a big bank, <laughs> in a big design team as well. And so then I had different uh, uh, experiences working with startups, having uh, eventually some consultancy roles, also doing um, design end to end in all sorts of setups. So yeah, I I I got I really went all in with all the design experience, and now it's basically who I am. <laughs> So wh- why do you think the um, opportunities for like younger designers wasn't or like junior designers weren't being offered? Like, what was the thing that's actually blocking that? I think this is a really important question that we need to ask ourselves. The industry recruiters, managers, everybody needs to be talking about that. I think that it's like a disease throughout the design industry that people uh, don't want to hire or are reluctant to hiring junior designers because. I think the reason is uh, actually a mix of elements. So one of them is the fact that many companies don't understand what they need from a designer. And so they feel like they need a senior designer to tell them what they need. And that's fair. But at the same time, a junior designer might easily do the job they are they need. Um, of course, a junior designer that is not necessarily a blank slate uh, as to, uh, to understanding design, but has been through a course, has done some practical volunteer or all sorts of practical projects and so yeah I think that on one hand companies are reluctant to giving juniors a chance on the other hand I we see more and more juniors entering the market 
and their expectations is that, is that the UX industry is thriving and it will explode yeah. and there will be 100 million designers by 2050. And so maybe they have unrealistic expectations. And so there's this common, there's this frustration on both ends. And I think that companies probably should, I don't know, maybe try to understand their needs better. Maybe senior designers need to educate companies, but not educate from a superior way, but maybe help companies ask themselves the right questions and understand whether they might be needing a junior and juniors will eventually get more chances. I hope I made sense with all this. Yeah, no, no, that's, that's, that's brilliant are, advice. Are you in the Bay Area by the, I just by, are you, are you uh, in Europe? I'm in Europe. I'm uh, in Bucharest, Romania, but okay. I, uh, yeah, so I haven't, uh, actually in 2019, I've been to the, to US, to the U S I've been to New York and then to Seattle. And when I went to New York, I said, okay, I'm going to move to New York. I have to do this. And then when I went to Seattle, I said, okay, I'm going to move to Seattle because it's more family <laughs> oriented than New York is. And so I, I wanted to move. Uh, but yeah, the pandemic happened and then I had a baby and right now this is probably not going to happen. So I will always be based in Bucharest. No, the, reason, the, next. The, the reason why I ask is because me and Ryan have spoken about this in terms of like, because I'm based in Europe as well. Uh, and the cultural, um, the culture of design and designing product does feel a bit behind. It's more agency led. So you, someone comes in and leaves and there's this mishmash of UX designer, UI designer, web designer. It's like, it's just someone who knows how to use Photoshop is like from people outside of it. And so the value of some like of mentorship and apprenticeship doesn't seem to be that well developed here, but um, it's, it feels like that's developed in, in the States, especially in California. I mean, do you think that, and what would your approach be to actually fix that problem here? Um, like in Europe, that kind of culture of. I think you're spot on with what you just described. I know that I've, I, I got the opportunity of talking to different diverse uh, design leaders and it's not the first time that I hear this, that basically uh, Eastern Europe is way behind Western Europe in terms of design literacy and design culture. And then Western Europe is way behind the US in terms of design history and how well design is understood throughout the industry in organizations in, in the business world, in tech and, and so on. So um, I think, I, I don't know what the, um, what the remedy would be, so I don't have a magic pill for it, but my two cents would be that probably uh, more events, infusing the local scene with uh, thought leadership from the more mature markets. It's okay to use the know-how that's already there and then infuse it and bring it in the less mature markets. and probably have more people evangelizing design, advocating design, reaching out to companies to offer help because maybe some companies aren't, aren't even aware that they need design or that they need some sort of design efforts in their company. And so probably there's not um, uh, enough design leadership yet in these underdeveloped design countries. And yeah, I think just more conversations <laughs> is, is, the, is a good point to start with. And uh, why not using, leveraging the experience that more mature uh, systems, cultures, places have? Yeah, I think that's a, good, that's a really great breakdown. I totally agree. The first place to get started is just having the conversation, right? Where it's like, let's acknowledge that, you know, there's a lot of people that I think, you know, don't have a ton of UX background, but if you gave them the, the right mentorship and the right projects to kind of run with it and learn with it, um, you would have a you would have a, a person that could totally fill the role like very quickly but there's this stigma where you have to have x amount of experience and you've everyone's seen the memes like on like twitter and like across social media where it's like you know it's an entry-level job but you need five years experience <laughs> where it's like yeah. it's like it's like come on like so we all started there i this uh, and like that was super relatable for me i don't have i wouldn't say i have like a traditional ux background i was like a graphic design major that was like in a business in like in a corporate business role um, somebody very similar to you uh, kind of showed me a project that was basically designing an interface, which was, you know, it was somebody actually worked at this company that was in human computer interaction. So HCI, and that's like very similar to you. Like you found that spark and then I, that's what I wanted to do. I was like very passionate about it. I liked working with products. I liked working with people. It was like the perfect marriage between two things that I, I really enjoy. So that's very relatable. And I think anybody listening uh, that's, you know, in a role or a job that they don't necessarily like, you can transition to UX. And I think Iwana is a great example of this. And the fact that she creates content that makes it easy if you've never heard of UX design 
you could review her contacts uh, or you in uh, like try one of her courses, start with her Instagram handle, and just really get a uh, a deep dive on 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 various UX topics. So um, that that's really cool. I'd, I'd love to hear a little bit about you know where you're at now. So you're at UiPath. You're a UX manager. Can you talk a little bit about um, your role there? Yeah, um, I'm at UiPath is actually a company that has this amazing journey. So it's absolutely spectacular. I'm really happy to be part of this journey. They started off in an apartment in Bucharest. And right now they're like, I don't know, evaluated at 35 billion. And they're like, they had this insane growth. Of course, they now moved to New York, Seattle, because they want to be where the tech scene is at. But uh, it also has a Romanian component, uh, very prominent uh, as well. I'm uh, working in um, uh, one of their core pro on one of their core products. So they started off with big, with three big products, and now they diversify their portfolio of products and services. They're doing robotic process automation, which means they're helping companies automate menial tasks. And like we like to say, we make room for more creative work. And so that people do more meaningful work and less repetitive tasks. So this is pretty much uh, the mission in a nutshell. And as um, yeah, I, I, I've uh, led the redesign of uh, this core product um, from a design standpoint. And um, also, yeah, I'm part of a global design team. We all um, we we work together into building a unified uh, design culture and uh, of course a design system for that to be achieved and um, yeah I've been I've been leading things on my uh, product but also trying to work globally with the team because being a new company you can imagine that the that actually no function is yet fully matured and fully blossomed and so design made no exception and uh, yeah we're all working on making it uh, as fast as it grew to take design to a level of maturity as fast as possible. So yeah, that's it in a nutshell. But right now I'm on maternity, maternal leave, because actually in my country you have up to two years of oh, staying wow. at home <laughs> with your baby, which is incredible. Yeah, and I'm gonna probably take advantage of this uh, legislation we have available. <laughs> that's great. That's amazing. Yeah, yeah which is a I great transition. Um, of the work-life balance piece but go ahead Mustafa before we jump now in. Going, you're managing there as well right yeah well actually um I was offered this managing role um I mean it was called UX manager in the beginning uh because they didn't really uh they, they thought that it's like a product manager role and so yeah. there is a product manager, oh, and, a UX manager and everybody's a, so a community manager and there wasn't a human managing component uh, oh, in the okay. beginning although I challenged it and I said okay but if it's called a manager then you probably need to be leading people right and so, no, but you're leading the experience. So this is where we started with. Sense. But then eventually I managed to convince HR and my team that we need to hire more designers. And uh, somehow I became uh, sort of a mentor or informal lead to some designers throughout the organization or people who are looking to transition into design roles throughout the organization. And so there was a component of mentoring more than uh, actually um managing like um evaluating them or the designers being my direct reports but yeah there was a lot of um leading if you want informal yeah. leading yeah and the reason why i ask is it's like there's that transition of um going from being a, an individual contributor where you're just your sole gun for hire to manager and sometimes we think when you see the manager on linkedin it's like oh wow this person's been promoted but it's actually this person's changed jobs because now you're not designing products you're designing careers so i'm just wondering like do, do you see that is do you see that as an evolution of just like what you're doing or is it like an extension i mean how do you uh because when i was i because i was a manager for a bit and the thing which i missed was actually doing the thing because that's yeah. always been my thing so how do you balance that like what would that be? Work, work balance or <laughs> work manager? <balance? laughs> I don't know what you've yeah. got. Yeah, it's a career I love management. The question. Yeah, I love the question. I love this topic. I think it's, it's uh, really important that we start to discuss this because ma many designers at some point in their career, when they become like a senior UX or a UX lead, then they consider, okay, what's next for me? I have to start to uh, manage people. This is, this is the next step. When in fact, that's wrong because you should ha have the option of pursuing two distinct paths one is uh, the individual contributor and then going up to, I don't know, becoming a principal UX designer. So just 
but staying in close contact with your craft and not necessarily becoming a manager because maybe you're not even good at it. You're a great designer, but that doesn't make you a great yeah. team lead or uh, manager. And so, yeah, I think that many people, it, I think it's not necessarily specific to the design industry. Many people are kind of forced or pushed into management roles because that gives them the idea that they're evolving, that they've been promoted, that they now have more responsibility. And many of them fail because they were great designers, but they're not as good people managers. And yeah, I think that companies or at least mature companies should provide both uh, journeys. So, yeah. Yeah. yeah, that makes it that makes a ton of sense. I think the options, I think the idea of being an individual contributor where you don't force people into being a people manager is, is important. Um, so I think the variation and like, you know, f figuring out what where people are going to see the most satisfaction um, is like the most important thing to kind of double down on. So I couldn't agree more. I think that those are some, some awesome points. Um, so so far, like, so you're, you, we, we've talked a little bit about like your career to point. We talked about the UI path and you also have like a ton of these, for lack of a better word, side hustles that are almost like full-time hustles at this point. So you're, you, for as long as I've known you, you know, through Instagram and through like, you know, the web, you're always very, very busy. So, <laughs> um, like I was, you know, you were very active on Instagram. You, you have, you know how to grow an audience. So, you know, if you were starting, say you were starting an Instagram channel and they look to UX goodies as an inspiration, what tips do you have for someone to start from nothing and get to a large following that's as engaging as the audience that you've been able to reach so far? So yeah, right. Start taking notes. <laughs> I know it's like also just like you know, there's a, a little bit of course of a, some personal interest here as like you know we're a young podcast looking to grow. But I also think that I'd love to hear more about your content strategy is kind of where, where the root of this question is, because I think it's brilliant. I think the branding is brilliant. And I think the way that the community like looks to you as a leader in the space is also brilliant. So, um, yeah. I'll and and it's here. natural, not organic. That's the main thing. It's not like someone is just blasting content. It's like, how do you um, build that naturally and organically? Yeah. I hope I will be able to answer this question <laughs> because for, for most part of my uh, Instagram journey, I kind of had no idea what I was doing. <laughs> so it all fe fe felt like a lot of trial and error, a lot of experimenting, a lot of unknown. Then all these features appeared. I'm not naturally a quick pick up -er of features. So I'm really resistant to change. And I was uh, overwhelmed by I don't know reels then first Instagram TV which I didn't use for like a year and then I tried it out then with reels so I'm not necessarily um, really good at social media but probably I'm good at messaging or talk reaching people with some with, with content which also I'm not doing by using any strategy probably I should so I, I kind of I had this uh, really uh, overwhelming for myself uh, an overwhelming growth on Instagram and and then it kind of slowed down or it stopped and I think it stopped because now you kind of need a strategy so after a yeah. certain point so that's not, probably growth will happen if you have some interesting things to say for a while but then you really need a strategy to to keep because then also I think something happens with the algorithm big pages kind of probably I don't know for me it feels like if you have a large audience and Instagram kind of pushes you into having to pay to promote your content and to reach yeah. people because otherwise people who would uh, open the Instagram feed would only see big pages so yeah. that doesn't make sense for smaller pages and so yeah uh, I didn't get I don't have the key to Instagram success but my advice if I were to uh, articulate some nuggets of uh, wisdom if you want uh, I'd say that um, you need to find your voice, which may sa sound very cliche or a very broad or I don't know, like w what does it even mean? But it, it, it actually means something very tangible. You have to establish for yourself. What do you want to talk about? What are the main messages that you want people to? What are the main topics that interest you and you would like to uh, reach people with? And so for me, for a long while, especially in 2020, it was like mental health. And this was what I had in mind. I have to reach designers by talking about mental health. And then I switched. And now I'm in a, in a, in a stage of my Instagram journey where I want to um, help people navigate uh, the overwhelming ocean of information that's out there and answer their most common 
lost um, feelings. Um, yeah, so probably find your find the voice, find the voice. This is the number one advice. Then also be consistent. For me, this is what what worked. So for a long time, I posted. I don't know if not daily, every two days, for one year, and that's where the most accelerated growth happened. So being consistent, it's also important. I think the algorithm rewards uh, loyalty to the app. Yeah. Um, find your voice, be consistent, show yourself. This is something that I didn't do in the beginning because I didn't want people to say that it's because, uh, I don't know, she's also always, I don't know, this is pictures of her and that's why she gets likes. I didn't want that to happen. So I didn't show myself for like a year, but then I realized that if you want these people to know you to be your friends if you want to build a relationship then then it's important to put yourself out there and by show yourself i don't only mean show your face but also show your vulnerabilities show who you are show your struggles show your journey your story and so on so probably this would be my top three and also experiment with different features that instagram has this is important for example the stories uh, question uh, stickers polls all things that Instagram has, uh, if you use them, then probably you'll be rewarded for using them and you'll, you'll uh, grow your reach. So it also uh, sounds like you're, you're like there's a, Instagram constantly is adding new features. So you don't use yeah. all the features. You're saying find the ones that are right for you and make the most of them. I, I agree. Like I, I know you use like the posts, um, like the quizzes and polls. So that's an immediate real time reaction for people. You're creating yeah. it to be more engaging. Uh, that, that that's great advice, um, Musafa. What, what did you have to add there? Yeah, no, well, I mean, I remember. I think it was like I O twenty nineteen. Ryan said to me, "You know, you need to open up an Instagram account." And I'm like, "Nah, I'm just on Twitter, man. This Twitter is my jam." And <laughs> just you know, and th what I've noticed is like Twitter has a very technical background, and design Twitter is there's a few famous people, but it's pretty much memes by this point. Um, so one thing that really surprised me is like the UX knowledge that's shared. So the question I want to ask was, say like a new designer wants to promote their work. I mean, we've got so many platforms now, but it's hard to know which one to focus your time. Like we have Dribble, we have people's own blog posts, Medium, Twitter, Instagram, Snapchat. I mean, um, from your own experience, what would you say would be the good time investment for a designer who's not necessarily trying to be a, a thought leader, but they want to have a presence online so people can see that they've got validity to the work and the stuff that they actually do. I mean, what would you say would be like, I suppose, the top three platforms <laughs> like LinkedIn, you know, from the ones which I've mentioned or maybe others that we haven't even heard of? Yeah, um, truthfully, to speak from my own experience, Instagram hasn't really uh, brought me like direct clients or work inquiries as much as LinkedIn has. So for me, even with a huge following on Instagram, still LinkedIn works best for finding jobs, networking with people who might help uh, grow my career. And so I would start by telling everyone that they should be using LinkedIn. I think LinkedIn is right now at a, at a stage where the algorithm is very generous because you posts are shown based on what your network interacts with. And so it's easier to be discovered. And if you have some successful posts, it will easily reach more people or maybe not necessarily more, but more, um, let's say, similar or more in the realms of what's focused. relevant to you. Focused. Yeah. 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 So. I, I would say LinkedIn is really important. Um, in terms of format, I think that if you if you want if you're in the early stages or not necessarily early, even senior stage, and you want to share something around the work you are doing, I think that you might want to leverage some um, platforms like Dribble or Behance. But I have something against Dribble and Behance. If uh, people just want just resort to putting images out there, some flashy screens, eye candy stuff with no context, no explanation. I hate <laughs> that. I don't want to encourage that. I want people to actually take the time to build a case study and help people. So Medium would also be great for that. I think Medium is an excellent uh, channel to tell your work uh, experience, to share your um, the problems you've solved, the products you worked on. So everything, um, yeah, Medium is awesome. So, so I would I say link, yeah. No, I think, so, no, I, mean, I think that, I think that make, that's a, a, a great summary. So we have Instagram to kind of just like grow the reach, right? You're reaching a ton of people. You can get the content out. You can get the consistency out. LinkedIn is like the next level down, right? Where you can kind of get these real job connections, the deeper relationships, almost like that one-on-one -on -one interaction to kind of filter through, which is very difficult on Instagram at times. And then I love, I love 
how you framed medium. I, I agree with you that it's a missed opportunity for a lot of designers. And you also kind of highlighted my biggest concern with Dribble and, you know, other Behance. similar platform in yeah. yeah, is that you don't see the process. And I think most UX designers grow by looking at their own process, learning from other people's process and documenting their process. And Medium gives you the opportunity to do that. So um, that's actually so, the first time I've heard those three, but I think it's a great summary of like where I would personally invest my time as well. Okay, I mean, I it sounds two hundred and ten follow ten two hundred thousand Instagram followers though. So, but I mean, I suppose it, I mean it sounds more like a as like what your strategy or what your intent is. If your job, if your intent is to build up a following as a thought leader or just sharing knowledge mentorship then instagram seems like the place to be right. if you're if, if the thing you're trying to do is develop a portfolio and like to get on the career path then linkedin which i mean i i completely agree i think linkedin is really under um uh, what would be the word like it, it it's like has this image of it's just this like rubbish crappy site but again some of the most meaningful career relationships have been developed from that and actually really respect as a platform and i think there's this kind of because it looks very blue and corporate -y, like it has this negative thing but it's it it's like i said this to ryan before it's better to have a thousand uh users or a thousand like followers who are a actively engaged and a hundred thousand where maybe two or three are actively engaged and i think linkedin's got that focus so yeah nice um i suppose again just to summarize i think it's uh you have to build your strategy right like depending on what what you're trying to achieve in your career yeah. yeah, absolutely. So it, it's really um, it's really dependent on what you want to achieve, what do you want to what do you want to get out of it? Why are you doing it? So start with that question. Why? <laughs> like yeah, with yeah. any design challenge. <laughs> yeah, that's brilliant advice. Um, so you want to? I know you. I don't know if you want to talk about it now, but I'm pretty excited that you have a boot camp academy that you're interested. That's live, or it's going to be live soon. Um, why don't you tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah, it's going to be live probably next week, but I don't know when this episode is going live. So probably it will already be live when we're going live with this conversation. So yeah, we're really close to launching it. The bootcamp is a project that I've uh, worked with a team of designers for almost a year now. It's, it, went, it has a lot of intensive work that went into it because we know that the education, the UX education is broken and we didn't want to add to the problem. So we didn't, didn't want to... We, we started by saying there are a lot of things that are going bad throughout the design industry as to how designers break into the design industry and can we fix some of those problems. So this is how we started out and that's why it's taking a lot of time because we've also done a lot of research, talking to people who are uh, looking to transition, who have freshly transitioned and so on. We really wanted to apply the UX process to building this bootcamp. And so it took a lot of research and efforts to understand what problems we will be solving. And probably we won't be able to solve all the problems in the design education world, but we will definitely solve some of them. And maybe, hopefully, what's most important for me is that we're going to uh, help people uh, graduate with being prepared for a real life job and with the correct expectations in terms of what's going to happen to them after they finish a boot camp. So, yeah, I'm launching it uh, probably next week. I will communicate on my channels, uh, Instagram, LinkedIn, everywhere. So people who Very are listening cool. to this yeah, episode. Yeah, we'll make sure when this episode's yeah. live, we'll link it in the show notes. But that sounds Absolutely. It's super cool. And, and uh, most, the most important part that I learned uh, in terms of what helps people break into the design industry and, and then thrive in the design industry, because it's not just about finding your first job but what do you do after you find your first job what do you do within the first year or two years of your design career because it's not just opening the door uh, so I think that what we discovered from talking to a lot of people and probably it may sound like a no-brainer but I think that it's not given as much importance as it should get is that you need a mentor and so we've built our entire bootcamp experience around mentorship. So we are not the first bootcamp that has mentors, but we are uh, organizing everything around this relationship. And then this, this sits at the core of the experience in order to help people understand that guidance, personalized guidance, is the most important thing that they can get in the early stages of their career. So, um, yeah, it's, gonna, it's also, it will have a name. It has a name. It's called Mento. 
So it stands <laughs> for mentorship. We want to uh, to communicate the fact that mentorship is the most valuable thing that we can give you, not necessarily the curriculum, although the curriculum has been the most intensive work that we've done to make sure that it's relevant and uh, yeah, that it will actually provide them with the concepts they will use in real life. And so, yeah, check it out on my, um, I will leave you uh, guys to <laughs> add the links and stuff. <laughs> Yeah, no, yeah, we absolutely will. That sounds r super cool. I totally agree with mentorship being like, a, a, you know, the foundation of building a UX career. Um, I had a great one when I was transitioning from the business world to the design world. Um, so this is like super relatable for me. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I never had any mentor. I just basically had to fail my way through. <laughs> <laughs> and cause, uh, the other thing is, is uh, again, is that this is possibly a UK Europe thing. A product, because um, like, I started in 99, a very long time ago. Um, and so product excellence is mostly graphic designers being the mentors. So the websites and apps that were being designed were designed like posters with buttons on them. And then the Flash era came. So it's like, the, I I think a mentor would like supercharges your career because you cut out all of the unknown unknowns quickly. And then you can how develop your strategy i mean the first 10 years there was no strategy so get a job get a job <laughs> do work <laughs> fill portfolio get a job <laughs> like oh i have the same work new job new portfolio and i mean that's basically been my strategy for like 20 years now <laughs> yeah i love your point about the unknown unknowns and indeed uh, a mentor supercharges your career and it, it it's supposed to help you actually uncover your uh, qualities what you can bring what value you can bring to the design world and also help you with understanding what you should be working on. So maybe just finding a better definition of yourself, understanding yourself better and how you can work into in the design field. So yeah, I'm hoping we'll do good. No, it, that's great. It's exciting. I, again, I don't know how you are able to manage all of these different projects, but it's very, very impressive. One other, you know, another thing to add to the list is your newly launched podcast. Um, honest UX talks, another phenomenal thing. I think it, you kind of hinted at the type of content that you cover. Um, you care a ton about like, you know, um, you know, mental health and being, you know, being vulnerable, showing like, you know, the, the, basically the good and bad of design, as well as just a ton of helpful resources, um, and tips to be a better designer. So do you want to tell us a little bit about, you know, why you decided to start a podcast and really like, Who's the, who should be listening to that? What kind of audience are you going after? Love the question. Thank you for asking. So, yeah, indeed, just like you said, and uh, you described it perfectly, um, because I wanted to be open about what's happening in both in my life and in my introspection efforts and in the design industry as a whole, and probably in, with every designer, I said that we need to have honest conversations in which we open up and we talk about struggles, about things as they are, and not because there are a lot of conversations in the design industry that talk about what ideal situations look like and uh, i think that people can easily find information about what's ideal but it's not that easy to find information about what's not actually working in real life or what what's what's a struggle or what what are the most common challenges that designers face both in terms of their relationship with themselves but also in terms of their relationship how they relate to the design ecosystem so that's how Honest US UX Talks uh, came about, uh, at least the title, because the idea uh, actually was um, my co-host, uh, Anfisa, uh, and uh, she reached out to me with the idea of a podcast. It's the same like it happened with the bootcamp. So my friend, uh, who is my co-founder with the bootcamp, he reached out to me. He was a designer at Fitbit at the time, and he said, you know what? Let's build a school because I have all these ideas and so on and so forth. And so um, to both of them, it's, it's just like the same thing. I said, whoa, 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 I'm having a baby. I can't <laughs> commit to anything. I'm not going to do it. I'm sorry. And then they said, don't oh, wait, because we can all understand. So Anfisa was the same. She was super understanding that I didn't feel confident that I will. It's just like you said, it feels like I'm doing a million things. And I'm also often... Um, contemplating uh, burnout like a thing that's gonna happen tomorrow and so I think uh, that I, 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 I was super reluctant to both of these projects 
and uh, but they were very understanding and they said that they will support me through the journey when I need a break I can take a break there's no commitment there's no pressure everything will do will be relaxed and so yeah and FISA was actually uh, behind the podcast uh, initiative and then we we just said you know what it's gonna be like a weekly conversation where we meet for coffee just like you Ryan uh, set out for um, would set up this conversation and so uh, yeah it's exactly that we just meet on a weekly basis and we chat um, around one particular topic that we are hoping will help designers I think in terms of audience since I got here I think it's for um, both junior designers but also mid to senior designers it's not for people who are have 20 years in the design industry I, I don't think that we can talk to them and to their problems but it's for people who are like in the middle of their career or in the early stages it's not for complete beginners because there's a, a bit of a um, complexity sometimes to the conversation but yeah that's pretty much it Brilliant. I mean do you do you cover like mental health strategies like or like being open about things which can go wrong and like how you can actually help fix those things because I mean, the thing which I mean we haven't put this episode out yet I don't think or will be out when this comes out but we, we, we found a study that was done by um, Stanford University and they talked about zoom fatigue where people um, are feeling exhausted and we think oh, you're, you're at home all day but they've actually done a study and they found that people staring at GVC like video call comment actually is tiring people out mentally and exhausting them so people we're almost building up this debt mental health debt which is going to eventually implode because everyone's going through it at the same time. Um, I mean, is that sort of things that you're covering specifically? And are you thinking of strategies of how to help people do that and how you cope? You know, so I, fatigue is, is a great idea for our next episode. <laughs> <laughs> we, we, can send you the, we can send you the Stanford thing because they had four bullet points of things which affect and then the strategies you can do. And it was, we found it really interesting because it's, it's almost like it's an excuse. Oh, I feel tired. But there's an actual genuine symptom and there's genuine things which we found was like relatable. Yeah, I, I think that we haven't yet focused enough or as much as we set out to uh, uh, on uh, mental health topics. We had some episodes. Uh, we had an episode on burnout where we invited a designer friend who actually experienced it recently. And he he's the founder of UX Bytes, which is another cool um Instagram profile and then he quit completely Instagram and for a year nobody heard of him and it was okay. really yeah like very um, drastic and so uh, we talked about burnout we talk about things like that we didn't necessarily uh, cover all the topics around mental health or probably not even the most important themes because we started with what the audience was most excited about and usually people want to talk about the process design yeah. systems uh, UX titles, how to transition, stuff like that. So we 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 took uh, the we started with the low hanging fruits, in terms of topics, and now we hope to refine and have more elaborate or, um, yeah. Yeah, well, we'll hold you to it. We would love to do like an episode dedicated to that because I don't think there's enough coverage on mental health just in careers in general, but mental health for designers as well. So um, yeah, that's brilliant. Check out um, Honest UX Talks. The, each episode's it's it's really well done. I think the fact that it, it feels exactly like you're sitting at a table with friends that are giving like really good career advice. So I can't you know endorse that enough. But um, I just wanted to say a huge thank you for joining. You're one yeah, of you. our early one of our early guests. We're still ironing out Design Huddle, but this was such an awesome rundown. We talked every, from everything from your you know your career growth how you grew, grew on Instagram, your new bootcamp academy coming out called Mento. And um, uh, yeah, just like work-life balance in general and how it's starting a podcast. So there's plenty more we can dive into on future episodes, but I wanted, to, where can everyone find you? Where do you recommend if people have, you know, follow up questions for you, where do you want them to uh, reach out? I think the easiest way to find me is with UX goodies on Instagram, but that's also where my inbox is super loaded and I am a mess with answering, uh, replying back to people. So I apologize to everyone who's listening and maybe <laughs> send me a message that I didn't yet reply to. Um, also, LinkedIn is a place where I have uh, less messages in my inbox, so there are more chances that we get to actually talk. And um, yeah. 
pretty much uh, that's it where I'm. I'm also on Clubhouse recently, so oh, I'm, nice. I was pretty oh, wow. active in, yeah, yeah. I, I also cool. have more than 10,000 followers on Clubhouse, oh, which wow. again, I don't understand how this happens. So <laughs> I, I wish I would tell people, hey, here's my uh, manual for building an audience, but then probably it was due to Instagram. So it was Instagram no, that's great. informing I mean, that, that, the, yeah. We'll make sure that everyone is able to find you. Um, good luck sorting through that, that inbox <laughs> on Instagram. That seems like that's a tall task. But uh, thanks, everyone, for tuning in to this episode of Design Huddle. And feel free to follow along on social, subscribe, and we will catch you on the next episode. Peace. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Thanks for inviting me. It was a great conversation. <laughs> Thank you for listening to today's episode of Design Huddle. The opinions expressed are solely our own and do not express the views or opinions of our employer.